Um, how do you set panning to the scroll wheel button? You hold down. Yeah. So if you want to pan your view, you hold shift and you press down the scroll wheel button. Oh, guys, um, important note for this tutorial. Um, I'm going to restart my Blender first. Um, because I am using specific keyboard shortcuts. So before we start, a prerequisite for this is that I'm using the 2.7 keyboard shortcuts. And for all of you who didn't set that when you first started up Blender, because when you first start up Blender for the first time, it will ask you what kind of keyboard bindings you want to use. For these tutorials, I'm going to be using the Blender 2.7 ones. And anybody who's more familiar with the older versions of Blender will feel at home with these. And if you haven't already done that, a good way to check whether you have done that is to click, left click, and drag in this area. Rather, sorry, left click um, anywhere here. Just click, left click. And if you see this circle over here with the red and white stripes, that means you have the Blender 2.7 keyboard shortcuts. But if this doesn't happen, then you should go into um, preferences. And under key bindings, um, sorry, I have to remember how to find this because I usually don't switch this back and forth very much. You should go to key map and over here where it might say Blender, change it in seven to Blender 27X. Um, if anybody's lost at any point, I want somebody to say a comment because I don't want to move too fast and I can't see most of your screens. So if anybody's lost at any point, feel free to shout out. Or if I'm going too fast and you haven't gotten here, just say, tell me to wait. Anyway, I've got Blender 2.7x keyboard shortcuts, which I'm going to be using for the rest of the tutorial. So then you click this gear button back and go back to 3D viewport. Once you've done all this, I'm going to create a new Blender file, file, new, general. And you should see three things. You should see a cube. You should see this, which is a camera. And you should see this, which is a lamp called light. On the side over here, you'll see this, um, what is called over here, it's called the, the outliner, which shows you a list of all the different objects that you have in your scene. It's a good way to group everything together without having to find it visually inside of your scene, which can be sometimes very tedious. So Alex has a question. How did you set your keyboard shortcuts again? Right, okay. So I'm gonna reboot Blender from scratch because this is the first thing you should do. I start up Blender and you'll see on the top left over here under the Blender icon, under that Blender icon, you'll see a grid with a ball icon. This determines the type of editor you'll have in the current pane. And when I click that, I'll have a bunch of different options. I want to click the preferences option because that lets me change all the settings in Blender. It has an icon with a picture of a gear on it. Once I've clicked that, I'll be in a new interface that has some tabs on the left and a big area over here. Click the one that says key map on it. And once you're in there, you'll see a menu on the top. This menu might say Blender. But instead, you want to click that menu and select Blender 27X. Alex, did you get all that? Yep, he got it. Awesome. OK.
So for those of you who don't know, Blender is a 3D modeling program. You can use it for creating things that you might want to print on a printer, 3D printer that is. You might want to use it for making movies, or you might want to use it for creating assets in video games. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you the basics of Blender, how to move objects, how to create lights, how to create little gears and stuff, um, how to make things bounce, break, or bend with physics. And I'm going to show you how to animate things. And at the end, I'm going to show you a crazy little spinny fractal cube thingy. But first, we got to start small. The first thing that you'll see when you boot up this Blender interface is a lamp, a cube, and a camera. By right clicking one of these, you'll see an orange outline appear around it. This means you've selected it. So if I see that circle over here with the little dots, that's the lamp. Rather, it's called a light. And you can tell it's light because over here on the outliner, which, by the way, could be preferences or could be a 3D viewport or could be a graph editor or could be really any interface you want to be, but is right now an outliner, you'll see all the objects you have in the current world. When you left click one of these, it will select it. So right now I'm selecting the cube. Right now I'm selecting the camera. And how can I tell I'm selecting the camera? Well, it's glowing. For now, let's select the cube. I'm going to middle click and I'm going to drag. When I do that, my view will rotate around the cube. This is because the cube is in the center of the screen right now. Being able to navigate your view is probably one of the most important things in Blender. So I'm going to cover that first. If you want to zoom in and out, you can scroll up and down. And again, if you want to rotate your view, you can click and drag the middle mouse button. By the way, guys, if you are on a laptop, I highly recommend you get a mouse. But in the event that you don't have a mouse and you don't have a middle mouse button, there is a way to get around that. But before I show that, does anybody here not have a mouse? I need to know that because um, there's a setting that you might need to change if you don't. OK, if nobody, if everybody here has a mouse and nobody's responding, I'm just going to assume that everybody here has a middle mouse button. So if you want to pan your view around, you can shift and press the middle mouse button and drag. This will drag your view around. Basically, you're panning it. You can scroll to zoom, shift middle click to pen, and just middle click drag to um, rotate your view. Now, remember how I said this object was a camera before? This camera can be a viewport for when you render things. Rendering means taking a 3D scene and turning it into a JPEG. That's really pretty and might take a few seconds to do that. This camera is also an object. Oh, I'm sorry. First, I have to tell you, if you right click and drag an object, you can move it. So if I want to move the cube, I can right click and drag it. OK, so someone in the live stream was asking, what should I do if I don't have a mouse? Yes, thank you for letting me know that. OK, if you don't have a mouse, we're going to go into preferences and we're going to change something that will let you do something without a mouse. Um, guys, um, if you ever get lost, notify me as fast as possible so that I don't lose you behind a bit. So in preferences, 
go there the same way that we did before to change the keyboard shortcuts. There should be an input option over here. And under mouse, there will be an option called emulate three button mouse. There's also something called emulate numpad, which will be useful. So I'll enable that as well. So go into settings and enable emulate numpad and emulate three button mouse under input. Did that answer your question? I'll show you how to use it in just a second. Basically, once you've done that, instead of middle clicking, you can press Alt, hold Alt down, and then click. And it will do the same thing as if you were middle clicking, which means you don't need a mouse to do this. Of course, it's preferable to use a mouse because it's nicer, but you don't technically need one. And this is how you get around it. If you want a pen, you can Alt, Shift, Left click, drag. Okay, um, guys, did that answer your question? Or are you still set changing the settings? I'm going a little bit slowly right now because I don't want to lose anybody. Just to let you know, I don't know if somebody told you this already, but the YouTube live stream is slightly delayed from the Zoom stream. How so that might be that? why there's a little delay in answers. Yeah, how delayed is it? I feel like it's probably like 10 seconds, honestly. Okay, so it's not that bad. It's not like a minute delay. Um, girl who had problem with middle mouse, did I solve your problem? I don't think she responded in the live stream. Uh, okay. <laughs> So I'm assuming it's okay. <sighs> what do I do? Okay. Um, if you want to join the Zoom call, please, everybody, by all means, do that because then you can just turn on your microphone and talk. It will be much easier and much faster. But. Oh, okay. I'm, so someone just said the Alt key as a substitute for middle mouse works for me. Thanks. Okay, awesome, good. Okay, we're moving on now. Um, so now that we can do that, we can pan our view around, right? We can rotate our view. And by left clicking and dragging, rather right clicking and dragging, sorry, we can move objects. Now, question is, we have one cube. What's better than one cube? Two cubes are better than one cube if you like cubes. I mean, if you don't, it might just be a bad day for you, but for cube lovers, press Shift D and then move your mouse and you'll get a second one. Shift D means duplicate. It's actually a little option down here when you do that. And then you can press Shift D again and then left click, Shift D, 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 left click. That's a lot of cubes. But let's say I want more. I want more cubes. There's no better way to do that than exponential growth. So what I could do is I then, um, if you want to select more than one object at once, you can right click one of the cubes. And then instead of just right clicking another cube, you shift and you right click. And just like files in a 
In a file browser, this will let you select all of them at once. Then I shift D all of these and I duplicate all of these cubes. And before you know it, you've got a lot of cubes. But let's say you want to select all of these cubes. You don't want to have to shift right click every single one of these. That will take forever. When you have a lot of objects and you want to select all of them at the same time, a good option is the B key. You can press B, which stands for border select. And then you click and drag the box region that you want to select. And then you'll select all the objects that went into that box. And then you can do the same thing we did before. Shift D, Shift D, Shift D, Shift D, Shift D, Shift D, Shift D. That's a lot of cubes. Maybe I've decided I'm not such a big fan of these cubes anymore. There's just too many of them. I could cut off a whole bunch of them by border selecting them again. Or if I want to be more creative and carve a hole out of them, I can press the C key, which will give me a brush for selection. When I press C, I'm going to get a little circle around my mouse. And when I scroll up, it will get bigger. And when I scroll down, it will get smaller. With this brush, I can click and drag to select all the cubes like that in that pattern that I click and dragged. And then I can press the delete key, which makes them all go away. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that I could du duplicate a whole bunch of these cubes. And in the most inefficient possible manner, oh my god, my CPU absolutely hates this. In the most inefficient, disgusting, stupid way possible, I could draw a smiley face. Okay, so Eric is asking, do all objects operate on meshes? No. Well, what do you mean do all objects operate on meshes? Not all objects are meshes. If that's your question, then that's your answer. But what do you mean do all objects operate on meshes? There are other kinds of objects besides meshes. For example, lights are not meshes. Cameras are not meshes. And there are other shape-like objects like text that are also not meshes. Does that answer your question? I'll get to that in a second. I'm going to be covering other kinds. Of, well, by a second, I mean a few minutes. I'm going to be covering some other object types later on. But right now, I'm just covering selection. But um, if you want to elaborate your question a little bit more, I can give you a better answer. Yeah, that mostly answered his question. So right now, I have too many goddamn cubes. You saw how long that took to duplicate? That took like a solid five seconds. There's too many things here. So what do I do? Well, I could try border selecting. But that's lame. There's a better way to do this. I can just press A to deselect everything I've selected. And then press A again. A stands for all. And then I selected everything. So A, 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 delete. It might take a few seconds. Let's wait on it. Oh, no, well, my, it, it will work. No, just, just wait a few seconds. Okay, you've made a little bit too many cubes there. And they're all gone now. All right, now that we have selection out of the way, I'm going to show you how to create different kinds of objects. If you press Shift A, you'll get a menu that will let you add different objects. There's another way to do this as well. There's actually a button up here called Add. You can press that Add button, and it will give you a whole bunch of different object options. Now, you asked if all objects are meshes. Well, these are all the mesh objects. But there's other objects like curves, or surfaces, or meta balls, or text, 
or volume objects or grease pencil objects. None of these are meshes. These are the only mesh objects. Meshes are the most useful kind of object in my opinion though. Let's create a monkey. Yes, there is a pre-built option for a monkey in Blender. This is actually a thing. Now, monkeys like this look kind of happy, but I'm a bit of a sadist and I like my monkeys to frown. And so if I want to be an evil person, how do I do that? Well, you need to be able to edit this mesh object. And so over here where it says object mode, I can go from object mode to edit mode. It's on the top left. You'll see a menu that says object mode. When I go into edit mode, by the way, you have to be selecting this object. Um, a quick little thing here is if I have this cube and I'm selecting this cube and you can see because that orange border around it and I go into edit mode, I'm only gonna be able to edit that cube versus if I then go back into object mode, select the monkey and go into edit mode, I can only edit that monkey, which is fine because nobody likes cubes and everybody loves monkeys. So I'm gonna delete that cube, select that monkey and go to edit mode. In 3D modeling or Legend of Zelda, for example, the first ones, Hopefully I can find a good shitty image of really, really old Zelda games here. Someone is asking, why do they make a monkey standard in Blender? I don't know. It's this thing that went back to the 90s when the first Blender came out and they just kept it. It just became this running meme across the developers where then they just have to put it in because if, it's, if there's no monkey, it's not Blender anymore. I think it's the mascot of Blender. So when you play 3D video games, you'll often notice that everything looks like a bunch of triangles, especially when you look at older video games. This is because all 3D modeling is composed with a bunch of triangles. Every 3D object you see is a bunch of triangles that are all connected together. But these triangles are made out of lines and those lines are made out of dots. And dots are the most fundamental part of 3D modeling. These dots are called vertices or a vertex, plural is vertices. And when you connect these vertices together, you get edges. Edges are the line objects you see over here. So if I select two of these edges, so do two of these vertices, you'll notice that this line turns from black to orange. So if I select this one and I select this one, that line turned from black to orange. And if I select a third one, it selects the entire triangle. Notice by the way that I'm, I'm shift and right clicking these vertices to select the whole thing. Let's say I wanted to make this monkey frown. What I can do is I can select the corners of its face, this vertex, shift right click, this vertex, shift right click, this vertex, shift right click this and that and that, and then right click and drag to make it go down. Right click dragging isn't the best way to move things though. The best way to move things is with this, what we call a gizmo over here. This move button over here will then give us this three arrows. And then I can click and drag one of those arrows to move it down very precisely in a single direction, instead of kind of having to eyeball it by right clicking and dragging. So 
So I'm going to turn that smile upside down. And no, oh, that doesn't really look like a frown, does it? Maybe I'll select more. I'll select this one and that one and this one, that one and that one and that one. And now we have a sad monkey, kind of. That's how the basics of how you edit meshes. Now, of course, we could just make the monkey even really, really happy. Just by dragging all of those up. I'm going to delete this monkey and create another just to refresh everything. You may have noticed that this monkey looks very polygonal and very chunky and not very, you know, <laughs> high resolution. It looks very low-fi. If you want to make it better, we can add what's called a modifier. And a modifier will let us do a whole bunch of different things, including smoothing objects out. To add a modifier, I'm going to right-click that monkey to select it and go to Modifier Properties. It's a little wrench icon on the right of your screen. I'm going to click Add Modifier, Generate, and then Multi-Resolution. Actually, sorry, I didn't mean multi-resolution. I meant subsurface, subdivision surface. Add modifier subdivision surface, not multi-resolution. This will make it smoother. As you can see, this monkey looks better now. I'll add another one for comparison. Before, after brilliant transformation. I'm going to add um, over here, there's something called viewport. I'm going to change it from one to two to three to four, and look how smooth that looks. You can actually do this with any object that's a mesh. It doesn't have to be the monkey. But just for point of reference, here's what happens when we edit that monkey now. Now when I click and drag one of these vertices, a big curve will pop out like this. Or a curve will pop out like that. And I'm just kind of stretching this monkey's head out. It's pretty crazy. I'm not going to say hairstyle. It's a pretty crazy skull style, man. We did surgery on a monkey. Gave him a spiky head. Despite all that smoothing, though, we can still see the polygons. So what often people will do is, because again, if you keep cranking up that quality and change viewport to 5 to 6, it will get really laggy because every single time you bring one, two vertices will turn into four vertices, will turn into eight vertices, will turn into 16. It goes up exponentially quickly. We actually don't need to keep subdividing it to get it to look nice and smooth. I'm going to bring this all the way back down to two. It looks, you can see all the polygons everywhere, but there's another way. If you press the space bar, you'll actually get a search bar. And every single command you could ever hope to look for, you can get by pressing the space bar. One of the commands is called smooth shading. Rather, shade smooth. And you can see that even though this is clearly still a polygon, you can, see, you can still see straight lines here. The smoothing looks as if it was no longer a polygon. It looks smooth. That's a trick if you're ever trying to model a character. Use shade smooth. Everything will look better for it. Right now, we've been dealing with the monkey, and it's looked gray the entire time we've been editing it. We can give it different colors, though. 
On the top right over here, these are all the different material preview modes. Sometimes you might want to see shading with light. Other times you might just want basic viewport shading, which is what we use normally. It's just plain old gray object mode. And sometimes you might want fancy rendered mode over here on the right, or sometimes you want wireframe mode, which lets you see through everything like in a 1980s War Games episode. Right now, I'm going to go back to regular old object mode, this white sphere over here. And I'm going to click the arrow down, and I'm going to click Matte Cap. Originally, it was Studio. I'm now going to click Matte Cap. And you have a whole bunch of different preview options here. One of them might be this one, which makes the monkey look really shiny. Another one might be this one over here, which makes it look like a rainbow. Or maybe this weird stripe one. Or maybe, you know, you get the hint. You can choose any of them. This is often useful when you're trying to edit objects. And sometimes things that um, are flat will look like the same color. This makes it easier to distinguish them. OK. So now that we know how to edit objects, let's try making something. Let's try making a chair, a simple chair. I'm going to add a cube first, the place that you sit on. And then I'm going to go into edit mode. And I'm going to press 3, by the way. Yeah, so um, view, um, viewpoint. And then top, bottom, front, left, back, right. If I go to the front view, it will perfectly align my viewpoint with that y-axis. Y is green because um, blue is Z and red is X. Well, think of it this way. X, Y, Z is RGB. So red, yellow, blue is X, Y, and Z. When I go into the front viewing mode, I can only see the x-axis and the z-axis, which means that if I grab something, it will never move at all in this direction. So if I go to the top view, it's still perfectly centered. If you ever want to see exactly where that center is, you can click this little tiny itsy bitsy arrow that you might miss on the top over here. It's very small right here. But if you click that, it will actually show you the median of where the object that you're selecting center is. For example, if I drag x up, it will move along in the x-axis. And if I drag z up, it will move along the z-axis, which we can't see because we're looking from a top view. But trust me, it is moving. And if I drag y, can go way off into the distance. Anyway, back to the point. I'm going to add the cube. I'm going to press 3 on my keyboard, which means go to the side view. I'm going to hit A to deselect all the vertices. And I'm going to hit B to select all the vertices on the bottom. We're going to drag them up because we're going to make the flat part of the chair that you sit on before we make the four legs in the top part. I'm going to hit B to region select those areas. And I'm going to drag it up. Wait a second, what's happening here? Why do I still see the cube? Well, let's take another view. This happened. Why did that happen? Well, as it turns out, the view of these two vertices is blocking the view of these two vertices. So when I tried selecting them, it blocked it. To get around that, you should go to x-ray mode. 
When I go into X-ray mode, this button up here, I can see all the vertices all the time, no matter what, nothing can block each other. When I turn it off, I can't see the vertex at the back of the cube. So actually I can't select it. But when I turn X-ray mode on, I can see everything. Going back into side view now, I can select everything on the bottom and I'm gonna drag it all up like this. And then I'm going to set everything on the top. And I'm going to drag it all down. OK. We've made a skinny cube. Is there anybody, again, if anybody's falling behind, just let me know. I'm going to keep going on ahead more. I'm all, by the way, again, I'm pressing all the different buttons. When you press seven, it brings you into the top view. When you press three, it brings you into the side view. And when you press one, it brings you into the front view. If you ever forget any of these, you can click view, viewpoint, and then select one of those. It actually tells you what button you need to do it. Okay. So now we have the skinny part of the chair. We're gonna make the part that you lean on. A, shift T for duplicate. And I'm gonna drag it over to the right over here. I'm gonna press R for rotate, or I could actually just click this one, this button over here. So remember how we clicked button over here to move it? I can also click this button to rotate things. And then I can click drag this to spin it around. OK, I want it to be perfectly straight. Well, it's actually a bit hard to get perfectly straight, because even though this may look perfectly straight right now, when you zoom in, it's actually not. You can see because, well, it's not perfectly straight. If you want it to be perfectly straight, what you can do is hold down control when you're moving it. When you hold down control while you're moving or something or rotating something, it will snap it into place. And then I can press G to grab it and move it over here. I'm going to shift A, add another cube, go to the top view, make this small, go to the side view. And I'm going to make it, I mean, I could just let these vertices and drag them down, but I'm going to do this in a different way. I'm going to use the third tool over here called scale. There are boxes on sticks. When you have these boxes on sticks, you can click and drag it to make it get tall. You can click and drag the blue one. And then I'm going to press G to grab it, or I could right click and drag one of those to move it into its place. Again, what we're making right now is very simple and very crude, but it's a start. I'm going to um, G and for grab, and then hold down control to snap them all into place. Shift D to drag this one so that it's nice and symmetrical while holding down control to make sure they're all snapping. And now we have four legs. So now we have a basic rudimentary ugly chair. <laughs> but we do have a chair, nevertheless. Let's add a floor. I'm going to add an object called a plane, which is basically what it sounds like, a flat plane. And I'm going to drag it down. I'm going to press S for scaling. Again, remember how I can either move it around with these joystick things, or I can press right click and drag for that, or I can press G to drag. Well, I can also press S for scale. I press S and I bring that up like that, and now I have a really big floor and one big lonely chair. 
everything looks very gray. <laughs> I could just use matte caps to make it a different color, but I mean, that doesn't really solve the problem because now this part looks exactly the same as down here. All right, whatever. We'll get to that in a minute. Right now, I'm going to ignore all that and click Viewport Shading. And I'm going to add a lamp. I'm going to add a point light. Actually, I'm going to go into the last one over here for Viewport Shading. You'll see that when I drag this light around, things that are near it get brighter and other things get darker, you know, like a flashlight in real life. When I have this light selected, you'll have this little light bulb option down here. And you can change the power level of this light to make it as bright as you want it to be. I made it so bright that it has super dramatic, crazy shadows. <laughs> You know what? There's nobody sitting in this chair. Let's add a monkey. This monkey can sit in the chair. Let's make it a little bit more relaxed. Just trying to make it nice and natural and fall down like that. There's actually a better way to do this. I can actually make the monkey fall into the chair because Blender has a phys physics engine. I'm going to make this chair a little bit bigger, drag it up, and I'm going to select this monkey over here. And there should be an object option over here called physics properties. Again, I'm selecting the monkey right now. And then I can select rigid body. And then I can select the chair and also select rigid body. But this time I'm gonna go from active to passive. I'm gonna select this floor and also click rigid body and go from active to passive. And when you've done all that and you press Alt A, the monkey will fall out just like that apparently. Apparently it kind of messed up a bit. It didn't stay in the chair. Why didn't it stay in the chair? That's because we set the wrong kind of bounding box over here. We set convex hole. Don't worry about what convex hole means. All we want is we want the monkey shape. It makes it better. And now the monkey collides with the chair. When I hit Alt A, what that did is it started an animation. And you can see on the bottom over here, uh, basically, start animation does the same thing as pressing the play button. If I pause, I can get to this room over here, or get a nice relaxed monkey in a chair. The sky looks really boring, though, doesn't it? The sky looks gray and dull and yucky. It looks like real life for the past few days when it's been snowing out. Let's try to do something more fascinating than that. Let's try clicking that world button over here. You'll see something called color and that color is gray. Let's make it blue, a brighter blue, a really bright blue. Okay, too bright, make it more tasteful like that. Yes, yes, I like that more. And maybe make the chair a different color. To change the colors of objects, click this ball when you're selecting it. Label material properties. And then you can click new. And then over here, you'll see an option called base color. And I can change that base color to something orange like that. 
Okay, I'm going to take a moment because I've done a lot so far and I want to make sure that everybody's caught up to me. Does anybody have any questions so far? Because I know I just kind of did a lot in a few minutes. If anybody has any questions, right now I'm not doing anything because I'm waiting for somebody to ask a question. Okay, so we have a question. How much RAM are you using? Hmm? How much RAM are you using? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm using half a gigabyte. Well, it's not a question, but somebody said that it looks like an Ikea chair. I think that's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what I aim for, Ikea, the pinnacle of furniture. <laughs> Why, thank you. I try. <laughs> hey, to boost your ego more, they said those are some pretty colors. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Honestly, you know what? To celebrate this wonderful occasion, I'm going to add some text. I'm going to add Shift A for text. Bring it up here. Go to the text option over here, and there should be something. Well, William Winters asks, how did you change the sky color? Right, yes. So you see this globe icon over here? World properties. Click it. Then you'll see this option called color. And you can just click and drag that all around and make it every color you want it to be. But I like to be a tasteful man and choose blue because it's the superior color. I can make it really strong, too. I can make the sky so strong, everything goes blind. <sighs> I'm not that evil, though. I'll make it zero. No sky. Everything is black. All you're allowed to see is monkey. That's all you get to see. Monkey and chair. No sky for you. You can change it to be whatever you want it to be. In a few minutes, I'm going to show you how to add a more interesting sky. One that has clouds in it, for example. If you're interested, there's a few directions that I can take this tutorial, but I think the one I'm going to take right now is to change this text over here and make it say Ikea, because I can. And now I'm trying to remember this. But again, if anybody has any questions, now's the time to ask them. Is it like, like you know what, actually, if you're at this point, just say yes. How many people are at, are at this point? So if nothing is wrong, say yes, I'm good. Yes, sir, I'm good. Awesome. Okay. Is anybody else? I'm going to move on soon. They didn't say yes, sir, but they said thank you. Okay. I'm just trying to remember how to set the text here. Uh, it says text over here, but I haven't actually used text on here in a long time. It's a paragraph, text boxes, font, geometry. No, no, no. Hmm. 
All right, I guess we'll do that some other time. I could look this up, but I want to move on to the tutorial. So we'll make squishy monkeys now. So again, we're going to play this animation back. And you'll notice that I have monkey. Actually, you know, it's even better than one monkey. A whole bunch of monkeys. In fact, an entire explosion of monkeys. Now that's better. What's better than an explosion of monkeys? An explosion of really big monkeys? Oh, yes, yes, but there's something even more special that we can do with that. I'm going to turn this into um, a soft body. And I'm going to get rid of that rigid body modifier. And I'm going to run it like that. Uh-oh, the monkey is sinking through the floor. I should probably try to add a collision here. There we go. Oh my god, the monkey's eyes fell out. Okay, that's not what I expected to happen. Oh dear god. Oh, that's terrifying. Okay. Um, Sorry, this, this stream has been cut out for maintenance service. You're not allowed to see this. Little children be advised, melting monkey eye faces. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of different simulations you can do here. One of them is called cloth. And dear God, I, oh my, oh my Lord. Okay. Um, maybe I should like glue these monkey's eyes to its face so that that doesn't happen. Just go in here and a tool that I never showed you how to use for editing meshes before. Um, I'm going to show you that right now. This is an emergency. So let's say I wanted to tape this monkey's mouth shut to make sure that it never talks about the screams about the horrors that I just put it through. I don't want to get sued. So what we can do is we can select these three vertices on that monkey's face and press F. And what that does is when you select three vertices and you press F, it creates a triangle. If you select four vertices and you press F, it will create a quadrilateral. And if you select all of these vertices, it will select all of them and fill them all up. Aha, that monkey can't talk anymore. He's got no mouth. The reason why the monkey's eyes kept falling out is because if you may have noticed, they're not actually connected to the head. So if we go into edit mode and we fix that, it should be fine. But you know what's really annoying? Selecting an entire loop of vertices by hand. Selecting this one and that one and this one and that one and this, yeah. Now, instead, you can hold down Alt. And when you hold down Alt and you right click, it will automatically select the entire loop for you so that you don't have to do it by yourself. Let me demonstrate. See this ring of vertices, this chain around the eyes over here? I'm going to Alt, right click that, and now I have the entire chain. By the way, if you want to have more fine-tuned navigational power and you want to be able to zoom around the screen, you can press Shift F. It brings you into Shift first person mode. Shift F. And now, like in a video game, you can use WASD to move. Funny thing is, by pressing the tab key, you can even enable gravity, and then you can can just like, um, you can press V to jump. It actually shows the controls on the bottom of the screen. I just, I just realized how small and insignificant we are. We can't, we can, we can't even jump up to the top of the chair. God, we're so tiny. Okay, all right. But anyway, the point is, I want to be able to navigate into this eye. 
Precisely. All right, we've exit. We've entered the monkey. We've entered the monkey, guys. We can see that the inner eye lobe over here is not connected to the rest of the monkey, says Surgeon Ryan. So what we can do is, after I've been navigating around, I left click and then I exit first person mode. And look, I can move this around without actually shifting the view more. I select this original loop, which I selected outside. I go back inside and I select the inner loop of these eyes over here. I shift, left click, and now I've selected both loops. See? I'm going to toggle x-ray mode so you can see what I'm talking about. And I'm going to go back into here. Oh, we're still in rainbow mode. I'm going to go back to studio mode. See how I've selected two things at the same time? Well, I'm going to connect them together. To do that, I'm going to press F. Uh, actually, hold on. So actually, F doesn't work for this because I have two different sets of edge loops. Actually, I'm going to create a demonstration to explain exactly what the problem here is. When I pressed F, it didn't actually do what I wanted it to do. It didn't connect all these vertices together like I would want it to. It just filled this in. What we want is to be able to bridge edge loops. So for example, let's say that I have a circle of vertices over here. And I'm going to duplicate that and create another circle of vertices over here. You can kind of almost see a cylinder, can't you? It almost looks like a cylinder, except it's missing the, the edge parts. You know, it's like, it's like an empty can without the walls. I'm going to select the bottom part too. When I press F, it doesn't actually connect them together. So remember how before when I pressed F, I showed you that you can select multiple vertices like this and we'll create a triangle. Well, that's exactly what it's doing, is creating two triangles in irrelevant places. I want to connect these together. Technically, I could select this and that, press F, select this and that, press F, select these four, press F, select these four, press F, select these. It's, it's horrible. This is a horrible experience that's meant for masochists. No, I'm not a masochist, and you shouldn't be either. You should use the bridge edge loops feature so we can do is select both of these. And then I type bridge, no, not bridge, bridge, edge loops. Look at that. All of them, it just knows which one to connect to which. Look, how is it supposed to know which one of these to connect to which one of those? Is it this one that I connect to like that? Is that what I want to connect it to? Or do I want to connect it to like that? The answer is, don't worry about it. Blender has magical algorithms created by God himself, and it will figure it out for you. So I select both of these and I type bridge edge loops in the search bar and voila, you have connected both loops. Someone in the YouTube live stream asked if you can color the different parts of the object, the monkey. Yes, you can. Um, I actually don't remember exactly how to do that in different objects most right now because I remember how the old version of Blender worked. I'm still getting used to the newer version of Blender, and I know there's a different option for that. Um, I could look in that for a future tutorial, but right now, um, I'm not going to show you how to color different parts of the monkey differently. The way that I would do that right now is I would split it into two objects and give them different materials. I know it's possible. Actually, second thought, I could show you how to do that. I can go into vertex paint mode. Yeah, you know what? Let's do it. There is a workaround. In fact, you can actually paint the monkey if you want to. Yeah, let's do that. Let's paint the monkey. Go here to vertex paint. From object mode, select the monkey. Go from vertex paint, object mode to vertex paint. And there should be some options for your paintbrush. On the top over here, you'll see color. And now I can paint the monkey different colors in different places. You know what? Let's give that monkey. It can't talk. Well, let's let's just paint a mouth on its face anyway. There you go. You can't talk, but at least you got some lipstick. 
and we can give it some black pupils like this. So it looks like it kind of has a soul. Or creepy doll, one of those. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know, this, this makes me uncomfy, but we're gonna do it anyway. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of different options for your paintbrush here. You can make it really big by dragging up the radius, make the entire thing all black, make it, make it a brighter color like green. So if you wanted to, oh, it's not painting the back of it. So you want to color different parts of the monkey differently? There you go, that's the way to do it. We could also use texture paint. That's a little bit more nuanced. Um, before we use texture paint, I have to introduce how you use textures. So I'll get to that in a few minutes. I'm going to do that with the sky first. But before we do any of that, um, I wanted to quickly show the edge loops. I'll just finish that right now and show you the physics simulation. And I'm going to jump to a different top topic, which is learning how to sculpt objects. So anyway, we were, we were editing that monkey um, over here. We have edit mode for that monkey. Sorry, I'll put edit mode for the monkey. I'm going to alt click these loops and shift alt click, uh, shift alt click this, this loop over here. I'm going to bridge those edge loops together. I'll click this, shift, I'll click this. Bridge edge loops. And now when we simulate this, the eyes shouldn't fall out. OK, it still looks really sad, but at least it has its eyes. If I increase some things over here like tension, it should probably be better. Bring compression up a little bit. Uh, oh, um, yes. Sometimes the numbers shouldn't be really big. Sometimes it's better to leave them small. <laughs> Hi, uh, somebody wants to know when this tutorial will end. I don't have a specific time planned. Um, how long has it been going so far? Um, like an hour. Okay. Um, I'll see if I can jump to the more advanced topics. There's a few things that I'm going to do, and then I'll, I guess I'll end the tutorial after that. First thing I want to show you how to do is to add a sky. So everybody go onto the internet and search HDRI image, HDRI. There's a website called HDRI Haven, which is pretty nice. Um, HDRIs, I guess, click one of those. Go to skies. What HDRI images are is like panoramic images that you can use to create your world with. So maybe download the 8K one. No, that's that's pretty big. Maybe the 4K one. This JPEG over here. Maybe that, that should be good. That's nice and big. Yeah, this is a nice big image. I'll send the link to this for everybody who wants it. If you could maybe send this, uh, Cynthia, if you could send this through the chat. I just realized people were talking in the Zoom chat. I didn't see any of this. <laughs> 
Um, if, if Cynthia, if you can read me what people are saying in the Zoom chat as well, that would be real helpful. So anyway, I've downloaded this really big image called Kloppenheim 06.jpg. Um, by the way, if you can just like post that, that link that I put in the chat so that everybody can use that image, or you can just choose your own. Kloppenheim 06.jpg is inside my downloads folder. I'm gonna open Kloppenheim 06, saying it to myself over and over so I remember it. Over here, we have surface background. Instead of having a simple color, we can instead click this, where it says um, color, click the circle next to it and click image texture. Maybe sky texture is better. What does sky texture do? Yeah, we'll just go with image texture. Image texture is better. And then I click open, go to my downloads folder and find kloppenheim.jpg. You may have noticed you don't actually see the image yet because you need to change a few other things. Where it says flat, it should say sphere. And where it says vector default, it should be position. Well, it's a little bit stretched out, but at least it's there. And so again, I'm gonna go to position and that gives us a better result. If I wanna make this shiny, what I can do is I can go into the tab over here where I had materials and I can get this monkey material. And if I wanna make it shiny metallic, I can actually drag up metallic like this, drag roughness down and then it can become shiny and mirror-like. So there's a bit more nuance than that, but that's the basics of how you can set the world's background um, to make this a little bit nicer. You can even make this floor a little bit darker. Maybe give it some metallic properties of its own, make it a little bit shiny. And if we want it to look really pretty, what we can actually do is we can set from cycles mode to Eevee mode. So there's a physics render, I mean, a rendering engine called Eevee. We set it from that to cycles, everything will look much prettier. You'll see that the reflections actually capture by the way, it will be slower. It will also be much slower. But you'll notice that the reflections now capture the actual monkeys. They capture the chair and they capture this. This just in general looks much prettier. Other options we can use to make everything prettier is a setting called ambient occlusion. This is a setting you might have seen in games. When I go to the world icon, there's also the ambient occlusion option. When I click that, you'll notice that shadows become softer and everything just looks generally prettier. You'll see that there are shadows underneath the eyes now where there weren't any before because light comes from every direction and everything looks prettier. I'm gonna take a little bit of a left turn here I'm gonna show you how to use Boolean operators to make little metal girders and beams and stuff. It's actually a very useful tip for modeling.
Let's say I wanted to make a hole in this chair. I'm going to duplicate this chair, <laughs> move my entire view somewhere else. I'm going to click here to move the 3D cursor to this chair. 3D cursor is nice because whenever I add a new object, it will always be added at the 3D cursor, which is this red and white thing. I'm going to add a cylinder because I want to put a hole in the back of this chair. How can I make a hole by adding a cylinder to it, you may ask. Rotation by pressing R, press X to rotate along this axis, and type in 90 to rotate at 90 degrees. Yes, that's a thing that you can do. This chair doesn't really look like it has a hole in it. It looks more like it has a regular chair with a big box cylinder thing sticking out of it. Just trust me on it. We're going to make a hole in it. I'm going to go here and I'm going to click Modifier Properties, Add Modifier, and I'm going to click Boolean. I'm going to do Operation, and I'm going to do Difference. And I'm going to click the eyedropper over here, and I'm going to select the cylinder. In the Outliner over here, I can actually click the eye to make the cylinder temporarily disappear. And voila, you have a hole. When I move this chair around, you can see that the cylinder is actually kind of digging a hole out of it. It made a cylinder shaped hole in the chair. And so if I actually go and turn that eyeball back on, I can see what's going on more clearly. I can go into edit mode. I can squash the cylinder down a bit. Move it like this. Again, make it invisible. And now I can see that this chair now has three holes in it. Boolean operator is honestly one of the most useful tools that you have in Blender, especially when you're doing 3D printing. Let's say that you have some kind of mechanical part that you want to bore a hole into so that a screw can fit in it. The best way to do that is to use the Boolean modifier and just bore a cylinder through it. After you're done with this and you don't, let's say I want to drag the chair somewhere else and all these cylinders are stuck to it, rather because the holes, the, the, rather they're not stuck to it because the chair moves and the holes don't move with the chair. I can click apply on Boolean and now it's been solidified. That mesh is now the way it will be forever and ever and ever. I can go into here and I have this chair. One thing about this chair that's kind of bad though is all these sharp edges. If I click over here, I can select edges instead of vertices. So this is where I select vertices and this is how I select edges. I'm going to select all the edge loops over here, all the edge loops over here, all of them over here, and here, and here, and here. Same thing on the other side. I'm going to press Alt B. Rather, just going to type bevel inside the search. And that will let you make it smooth. If you want to make it really smooth, you can turn the number of segments up like this. You'll notice that part of the object became smooth while everything else is still rough and sharp and pointy and unpleasant to touch with your hand. Actually, I'll just select everything on here and maybe not such a great idea. <laughs> I'll undo that. OK, now, bevel. Oops. Bevel. Just one segment is good enough. Maybe 0.01 is good. Yeah, that looks nice. This chair looks now more civilized than it did before. Might actually want to sit in this. What else is there? A 
Okay. We're going to go towards the end of the tutorial, but if anybody else has anything that they want me to teach them how to do, now's the time to mention it. Because I could do a whole bunch of things, but I don't want to drag this tutorial out too long. There are, there are so many things that you can do in Blender. It's, it's hard to choose which ones to show you guys. What I'm going to show you now is probably- You should start I a YouTube channel. <laughs> like, did, did you guys like the tutorial so far? Is, am, I, am I too slow? Am I too fast? There have been a lot of positive uh, reviews of your tutorial. Oh, yay. I can never tell if I'm moving too slow or too fast, but I hope I hit the sweet spot. Um, oh, wait, somebody asked, is there a way to create a sketch and extrude the sketch like in Autodesk? Yes, you can use a grease pencil. I'm not entirely sure how to turn into a mesh, but I'll spend a few seconds trying to figure it out. Um, but in meanwhile, I'll show you the way that I know works. Mm, should I get rid of monkey land or should I stay in monkey land? It's a hard decision because there's so many, you know what? I'll just take monkey land and I'll put it somewhere else. Click drag all these. Woo. Hey monkey, you're not supposed to, oh, cause the physics modifier is still going on. All right. Yeah, the physics modifier kind of constrains where everything goes. I'm just gonna move it over here. Press Alt A. Hey, hey, move it, move it. This sometimes happens when you add the physics operator because it, it baked the animation into it. And now, it because last time I made it do physics, it pre-computed it. Now it thinks this is where it gotta be. It doesn't, I'm just gonna disable. I wasn't even selecting the right monkey. All right, everybody die. Okay, back to, back to where we were before. I'm just gonna start a new blender file. Um, everything I did is easy enough to recover from. Over here, you'll see, oh it, yeah, actually, yeah, no, that's a green pencil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Can I turn the grease pencil into something more useful? I don't remember. Ah, uh, ah, whatever. I'll start with a simple way that I know works, which is we're going to start with a plane. We're going to start with a plane. I just created a new Blender file. We're going to start with a plane and delete the plane because we actually don't need the plane. I didn't delete the plane in object mode. I deleted it in edit mode. There's a difference. When I delete this in object mode, the actual object disappears and there is no longer anything to edit. But if I delete it while I'm in edit mode, there's still a plane. It's just, it has no data in it. And so I'm still in edit mode and that's the important part. I'm still selecting this empty plane with nothing in it. I'm going to control and I'm going to click. Rather, I'm going to hold down control and then I'm going to left click. And that will add a vert vertex wherever I'm looking. So I'm going to click over here and I'm going to click again and 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 again. And wow, look at this piece of modern art that could probably be accepted into the MoMA, honestly. They'll take anything at this point. And I'll select this vertex as well. I'll hit F, I'll select all of it. I'll press F and I now have an object. I have no idea what it is. We'll have to figure something out for it. Like, it's beautiful. Why thank you. Why thank you, I need that. I need that affirmation. It is, what is this thing? It's like, it's like a, it's an, it's an angry squid that lost six of its tentacles. And, and it's really angry about that. And so it's like fiercely chasing something over here because it ate all of its tentacles. All right. What so, a good interpretation. Well, thank you. So I'm going to take all these vertices and I'm going to press A to select all of them. And I'm going to press E. E stands for extrude. I'm going to move it down like that. I'm going to press E and then and now I have a 3D object. You can extrude it as long as you want it to be. In fact, extrude is probably something I should have mentioned much earlier, to be honest. 
I'm going to extrude this over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And why am I doing that? Well, because now I've got a bunch of squares on the side of it. I'm going to click the square button on the top that says face select. And once I have face select, I can select faces like this and that and that. That's a face too. This is a face. Look, look at all these faces. And then I can press E again. Then I can extrude that and I can do that and that. I can select that face and extrude that one. Um, Eric wants to know, can you set the sketch on an arbitrary plane that you create or on the plane created by a face? On a plane created by a face. Yeah. Um, you can do that. Let me just remember how to do that exactly because that's what you're talking about is a tool called red topology. Um, if you want to be able to paint onto another object with vertices, the red topology tool is a little bit advanced. I'm trying to remember how to do that in the new version of Blender. because I don't remember exactly how to do that. Um, yeah, I remember how to do it in the old version of Blender, but I'm still new to this version. I'll get back to you on that. Yes, you can do it on arbitrary. OK, you can do it on any plane that you want, but you can't necessarily paint on another object without the retopology tool. If you just want to be able to paint on a different arbitrary plane, um, yes, you can do that. Yeah, so the, the retopology tool would usually be somewhere on the top over here, but I don't, I don't see it. So they probably moved it. Maybe you read. No, okay, it's probably something else somewhere else. It was never a simple tool, so it's probably hidden somewhere else. Um, but if you want to create draw on a different plane, you can go into a side view mode. You can draw on that plane too. I mean, obvious. Like honestly, the simplest way to do this is probably just to create it in one mode and then flip it and rotate it around to move it somewhere else. But if you don't want to do that, we can just. Um, Oh yeah, sorry, actually you, you can't do that click control click thing unless you're in vertex mode. So so yes, you can do it on different planes. In fact, I can do it on whatever plane I'm looking at by default, even if it's a weird plane like this. So yes, you can do it on, does that answer your question? Um, if you're almost looking for a dart gun where you shoot vertices at another object and they land on it and then you connect them together, that's, that's a bit more advanced. But if you just wanna be able to draw on random arbitrary planes, you can do that. There is the grease pencil over here, which I'm sure you can probably create into a mesh somehow. I'm not entirely sure how to do that, but there is this grease pencil tool where you can draw on planes like this. People have actually made full, full movies doing that, crazy enough. Um, I am not that good at art, so I can't use that tool. But some people have made entire cartoons animated in 3D with the Screech Pencil tool. It's honestly amazing to watch. Really hard to use, though, unless you're good at drawing. So yes, you can draw things. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions or is, is, is does that answer your question? Do you want to know more? Oh, I want to show you all the sculpt tool. If you have a question, just blurt it out. You don't don't worry about interrupting me. I'm I'm waiting for you to answer. But in the meanwhile, if anybody wants to see, here is the sculpt tool. The sculpt tool is fun. You can can make pictures and, and like draw draw things with it and, and stuff. And, and I'm just gonna create a sphere and show you. I'm gonna create an icosphere, gonna drag those subdivisions up like this. And uh, this, this is gonna be fun. Go from edit mode to sculpt mode. And now I can doodle on it like this, like it's a piece of clay. It's pretty awesome. There's so many brushes here. So many different things you can choose from. I can even 
drag it around as if it was a piece of cloth. Although that can be kind of laggy, but really cool. I can I can drag it around with a snake hook object, make it do that. I can I can make it have a face. <laughs> give it give it a nice snake nose thing. Like, look, I'm terrible at this, but it was fast and it's easy. And if you're good at art, you can do better than me on this. Um, really what limits your abilities on this is your skill. <laughs> um, people have done really amazing things with this. Like, look, I can't do this. So I'm just gonna show you some pictures of what's possible with this tool. People have created really detailed objects with this tool. These are actually not the best examples I've ever seen. These are actually pretty simple in comparison to what I know is possible. But if you want to create really artistic, detailed, crazy objects like that, like that dragon, the sculpt tool is how you want to do it. So back to my little mess over here. Um, let's say I wanted to make, make him angry, give him some eyebrows. You can mush it around like clay. One thing that you may notice is that some parts are sharp, pointy, and spiky like this, though. For that, you're going to want to use a tool called dynamic topology. So the problem with this, the reason why these look so spiky is because when you look at the actual mesh object, one object, one problem you may run into when you're sculpting is that the mesh object, the vertices get drawn out and stretched because this sculpting tool mainly just drags and it's like the vertices, right? It just kind of drags them all around the place. But what if instead of having to just drag around the vertices, what if the sculpt tool actually created new ones so that this wouldn't be a problem anymore? That, my friends, is a tool called dynamic topology, and it is an amazing tool. I'm going to go back into center over here. I'm going to create a plane. And look, normally when you sculpt a plane, almost nothing will happen because, again, it's just moving vertices around. And I, I started sculpting the plane, and I end up with nearly a plane. On the other hand, there should be a tool somewhere here called dynamic topology. I'm trying to find it. I know it's here somewhere. <laughs> I've used it before, but I no longer see. Um, um, mm. Maybe it's in here. This would be an excellent time to ask questions, by the way. Advanced. Maybe. Maybe one of these should work. Nope. Hold on a second. I'm just going to look this up. They must have moved this in Splendor 2.81. <laughs> um, where is the button for that? In the sidebar? Oh, no? Yes. OK. All right. That's why I didn't see it. OK, to get to the dynamic topology tool, there's a tiny little sidebar over here. This tiny little arrow over here is what I was looking for. You click that tiny little arrow over here. And then you go to tool, and then you have all the brush settings that I couldn't find before, because that's where they moved it. All right, so that, guys, is how you find the brush settings. And once you go there, 
You can click the Dyn Topo button over here. And once I have that, I should be able to draw things. There we go. That's what I was looking for. And you'll notice that it creates more detail in places that didn't have detail before. This used to be a plane, and now the sculpt tool is dynamically adding new things as we go. It's honestly amazing, because I can go into here. I can zoom in more. Oh, it, it deselected Dyn Topo. That's why it didn't work. Reselect that. OK, there we go. I can zoom in as much as I want and get more detail. So to give you an idea what this tool is doing, you can see how some areas have tons of detail, whereas other areas have very little detail. So what can I do with that Dyn Topo tool? Well. Now that I have, it keeps deselecting it. Why does it do that? Well, I have to keep reselecting it. Anyway, going back to this, I'm going to take um, the snake hook thing, which looked really bad before. And you can actually make it as long as you want to. In Dyntopo, I'm actually going to take detail size and I turn 12 pixels down to three pixels, which is actually a higher resolution. There we go. You can make that one for some really high resolution. It's an alien planet over here where all the, all the weeds are little hairy things that come out of the ground. And then you can give those hairy things their own hairy things and those hairy things, hairy things can have hairy things. And those hairy things, hairy things can have hairy things. Remember that prob problem that we had where we run out of vertices? That problem has been officially solved with dynamic topology or Dyn Topo. You can sculpt as detailed as you want. Oh my God, there's going to be so many vertices in here. I can already tell. Yep. This looks like a tree. I guess it kind of does, yeah. But you can see how the detail is tremendous over here. And then over here, it kind of just bullshits this way and says, this is just a big triangle, which honestly is fine because you can't really tell. One thing you might run into is, oh my God, there's so many vertices. I could never use this in a video game. If I put this inside of, if I'm a game developer and I use this, I'll get the boot in five seconds because all of a sudden everybody's game, they're gonna slow down to like three frames per second. But I mean, how can I get rid of all these vertices without blatantly selecting them and pressing delete and waiting three seconds while my CPU tries to delete all of them and fails because it's taking so long. Maybe select this again. Border, select, delete. All right, we have less vertices. Congratulations, it's faster now, but it's ugly and we just chopped off the trees. That, that can't be the right way to do it. There's gotta be a better way. Luckily, there is, and it's called Decimate. So I'm actually gonna do this on a on this map, oh God, oh, please don't tell me you permanently chopped off those trees. No, destroying the forests. They can't do that, that's not good. Oh, thank God, they're back again. All right, the Amazon is saved. Gonna go back to object mode and I'm going to click the wrench mode. Remember how we add subsurface before, which made everything really smooth? This time we're gonna do the exact opposite. <laughs> Instead of adding vertices to make it smooth, we're gonna take away vertices to make it rough but preferably with tastes. We don't want to remove vertices that are important. We just want to remove the unimportant vertices. The decimate modifier is, imagine for every vertex you have, only 10, for every 10 vertices you have, only one of them will survive. If I set the ratio to 0.1. And then what will happen is that, oh, please, there we go. It has just one tenth of the vertices it did before, but it looks the same, doesn't it? 
it's pretty i mean okay i'm saying it's pretty crazy you just have to trust me because what happened is that it looks the same and yet it has 10 times less vertices in it look you see the face count over here this is the number of faces that it has when i drag this ratio down oh maybe i shouldn't click and drag it that's taking a while Oop. Blender, hello? Blender, speak to me. Speak, oh, there we go. Oh, it's dragged it up. Not exactly what I wanted to do. I guess I'll just click it and enter a number. I'll just put 0.01. Can't go wrong with that, can you? 1% of the vertices will survive. You see all these ones down here? See all these triangles? Some of these triangles will die. Ah, well, I guess some of those will die. But you can see that it still maintains the same general shape, right? I'm gonna click apply. Any minute now, we will have a result. And you will notice that there are significantly less vertices here. And yet all the detail that we created is preserved. The Decimate modifier is your best friend when you are working with things like 3D scans. When you are working with 3D scanned objects, like this, for example. Here's a 3D scanned object. Oh, 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 OK, I guess. I deleted that some time ago. Maybe that's good. Oh, oh, I think we have progress. There we go. Here's a 3D scanned object that I worked on one of my internships once when we we're trying to generate data. And all the textures appear to be missing. Oh, wait, no, they're not. All the textures are still here. All right, so this is a 3D scan of a house. Don't ask what poor soul sold their data to give us the scan, but the point is that we have it now. And now the rights to their house are mine. I can do whatever I want with this. I can blow it up. I can smash it. I can do whatever I want because it's all virtual and I can't do a damn thing about it. But the point is you would never use this in a video game because look how many vertices there are. Oh my God. You would never want to, look, most video games would take this wall and make it a single plane. Guess how many planes this is made out of? Going to edit mode. There's a whole bunch here. You know, that's actually not as bad as it was before. I think I probably already used the decimate modifier on this. That would explain why it's not so horrible. But often you'll have regions that have way too many vertices um, for taste. Like this, this stocking on the wall has like 500 vertices. This Christmas tree has like 5 billion. This chair, of, okay, this actually doesn't look as bad as I remember, but that's because I probably used the decimate modifier on it. Let's see, am I, do I still have the decimate modifier on it? Is that still then? Go to properties. No, not preferences, properties. Nope, I must have applied the modifier, which means it permanently saves it to the object. But you can see the point. I'm going to add decimate anyway, just to show you. So right now, there are a third of a million faces in here, a third of a million triangles. Just for context, a third of a million is a very big number. We're going to set this to 0.01, 1 1% of the original number of vertices. Okay, maybe that's too low resolution. Maybe we should do a little bit more than that. 0 0.05? I mean, it, look, this does look kind of junky and kind of funky and kind of crummy, but it is 1 20th of the size it was before. I mean, look, it used to be a third of a million. Now it's just 16,000. It looks terrible. <laughs> Let's set it to 0 0.2. All right, this is not so bad. One fifth of the vertices that it had before and it still looks extremely recognizable. Again, 3D scanned objects are notorious for being spammy with vertices because all these vertices are generated automatically by fancy computer vision algorithms that don't give a funk about the number of vertices we have and making it terrible for video games. But it is really nice to be able to scan just for, for context. If you've ever tried to make assets in video games, there's no better way to do it than just to scan them in 3D and then put them in a video game. They look so realistic. 
So yeah, that's the decimate modifier. I'm going to call this tutorial on two hours because I feel like two hours is a long time and I don't, I don't want to keep anybody who's, who doesn't want to go longer than that. Does anybody else want me to show them anything? Does anybody have any cool ideas that I could just chill to do for fun things? Somebody say something. What's something that you w want me to do? Blow up the house, except that might take a long time. <laughs> hey, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Can we do a view uh, tour of the house before breaking, blowing it up? Uh, you like, want to do a view? Have a camera and it's valid, that's valid. Like, want to have the camera take a tour of the house? Yeah, like uh, animate the camera going through the house. Yeah, sure. Okay, let me show you how to do animations. First, you need to know what a camera is. I never showed you what a camera is, did I? A camera is the thing that you look through. Okay, I've now explained what a camera is. No, but seriously, see this thing? When you press zero, you go into camera mode, which means you see what the camera sees. You know what? Right now, okay. A little bit of context. What I was supposed to do for this project is create training data. So right now the animation is literally Cthulhu's spawn. It literally every single frame is a random camera position. So I can get random training data. I'm just going to delete this camera because this camera has a lot of chaos attached to it. Let's create a new camera. So we're going to do a gentle house tour before we blow it up with dynamite. So I'm going to take this camera over here that I just created, and I'm going to hit zero. The best way to move a camera around is in first person mode with that shift F that I told you about before. Shift F, I can move around and I can just pan it like that. Ah, yes, here's our lovely dining room. You can see our luxurious chairs with the stuff on the table and the mat on the floor. Don't mind the floorboards. You might have to do some home renovation. But in either case, we've got Christmas trees. Don't look too closely. Your children may be scarred for life. But in either case, we now have this camera. On the bottom over here, there's a timeline. See this? These are all the different frames in the video. I'm going to press I. I is to insert a keyframe and a keyframe is how you animate things. So what kind of things can we animate? Well, animations in their essence in Blender are essentially just moving numbers up and down. For example, moving this location X number will move the location of the camera on the long X axis. You see what I mean about numbers? They're not just any old numbers. These are important numbers. If I move the Y number up and down, I can move it forwards and backwards. And if I move the Z number up and down, I can move up and down. You get the point, right? They're numbers. I change numbers. So when I hit insert a keyframe, I am tweening or I am transitioning from one number to another really slowly over a bunch of frames. I'll just show you. I'll just show you. It will make more sense when you see it. Lock rot scale. What does that stand for? Location, sorry. Location, rotation, and scale. I am selecting the camera, by the way. That's important because when I'm inserting a keyframe, I need to insert a keyframe for an object. Which object's location? Which object's location? Which object's scale? The one I'm selecting. I'm selecting the camera, and I want the location and the rotation of this camera to be set for frame zero. Now I'm going to move the camera a little bit forwards. And I'm going to change it to maybe frame... Right. Whenever you change the frame, it will automatically set it to where it knows it has to be. So I guess I have to go to frame 19 and then move the camera. Thank you, Blender. I'm actually going to change this camera a little bit to give it a bigger field of view. So now I can see more stuff. That's what field of view means, the, num the amount of stuff you can see. Anyway. I'm going to change set location rotations and look, I set it for one place. Now I moved it to frame 19 and I put it in another place and then I set the location rotation. So now I can go back between these frames and it will animate it. I feel like I probably made this way too fast. Let's see. Can you use WASD to control the camera? You can, yes. But first you have to press shift F. So if I press shift F and then I use WASD, I can move it, yeah. 
That's how I've been doing it the whole time, actually. So now I'm going to insert another location rotation thing at frame 40. Go to frame 70, do it again. Oh, and we're going to get a nice close up of that toilet over there. I love my toilets. Can they get up real close like this? And I am a fucking five year old right now. I love this. All right, let's play Alt A plays the animate, or you just click the clay button. You, you could also just do that. All right, we have an animation that brings us from the Christmas tree to the fabulous toilet. And the bathtub where we can then take a, oh my God, that is, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a good shower head. That's not a bug, that's a feature. That, that's a wonderful shower head and everybody should love it. All right, we've made our tour now. Now it's time to kill people. Does, I mean, who lives in this house? I bet a bunch of, I bet a bunch of, bunch of little monkeys live in this house. Hey, there's what, that's not a little monkey. That's a big monkey. Okay, let's make this monkey a little smaller. Move him up. Hi. It says, hello, little monkey. Your house is about to, you know what? Just don't worry about it. Just close your eyes. Everything will be fine. Gonna go here. Let's see. <laughs> there should be the explode modifier. There we go. <laughs> We're gonna just add the explode modifier. There we go. There we go. Okay. Let's see. Does this work? I should probably apply this first. Hmm, why is this not working? Hmm. This usually works in the other version of Blender without having me, me having to do anything. Let's see, am I doing something different? Let's see, let's see, there's gotta be some way to make that explode. Let's do a quick search. Oh, so we need a particle system. Okay. So before we use the explode modifier, we need a particle system. I'm gonna click one right here. Okay, that added a bunch of particles, but it didn't actually make it explode. Just a second. Let me observe. Oh, there's a thing called quick effects. I forgot about that. That's how you do it. You don't just use the modifier. All right, forget everything I said. We're gonna get rid of the particle system. Quick explode. There we go. That should work, right? Well, it's working for the monkey. I'm not sure why it's not working for the house. Maybe I should get rid of this one. Maybe I should reopen this file and try it again. Did you create this house? Uh, no, this was during an internship. They gave it to me so I could create data. It's during COVID, so I couldn't really explore people's houses. 
unfortunately. Oh, there we go. Haha, <laughs> it's going okay. There's the house. There it goes. <laughs> Why it looked like that though? <laughs> well, it kind of went kaboom, you know. That's how it be. That's how it be when your house go kaboom. Shouldn't the shouldn't the um the shrapnel go farther? Uh let's do that. I mean, right now I'm just using the the default settings here. Go away, Zoom. I don't need your, your little gooey blocking my view. OK, so let's create outwards velocity and make that. OK, first of all, before I do any of this, I'm going to reopen this. I'm going to decimate this because, again, lots of vertices are slow. So I'm going to I'm going to go back into properties over here. Because remember how like Blenders has a wonderful user interface, in case you didn't know. Every single little pane here can do whatever you want it to whenever you want it to, which makes it very different from most interfaces. It's completely modular. So if I want that um, properties modifier, I could put it over here, or I could put it up there, I could put it on the side. We even have a second 3D view if I wanted to. I could even have a second 3D view over here if I wanted to, so I can see it two places at once. That being said, that's why you might not have the same interface that I do right now because you could totally just change it to make it do whatever you want to. And this Blender file is old, so I changed it. I'm not using the defaults. So you might not be able to follow. In fact, actually, you definitely can't follow along. Only I have this house. This is my house. I'm just kidding. This is some other strange Mishmok's house. I'm going to use Decimate. I'm going to change it to 1. I'm going to change the. 3% of the number of vertices it had before. This should hopefully be much faster. And then I click apply. And you can see, look, this is clearly lower resolution than it was before. The texture is still there, though. But I mean, let's be real. Will you really notice the difference as it explodes into a million pieces? I don't think so. Quick explode. Number of pieces, 200. Outwards velocity, not one. 5,000! No, probably 50 is good. Let's see. There we go. Kaboom! If we want them to knock across different things, by the way, we can add like a little, little containment sphere for this explosion like this, and go into physics over here and add collision, and then add um, yeah, I just guess because collision. Why is it not exploding anymore? Oh, yep, uh, what? OK, let's try that again. OK, I guess when the sphere is touching it, it doesn't like to explode. We'll just add a floor then. And let us know all the particles are bouncing off the floor. We can create a wall too, like this. <laughs> you can see my construction skills are beyond measure. Please hire me for your home problem for your home projects. I'm like I'm 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 Bob the Builder right here. I think you're the opposite. Bob the Destructor, can we burn it, Bob? Yeah, something like that. I don't know. I don't know, but I, all I know is that in a few seconds, we're just going to get kaboom. Now import this into Minecraft and explode it with 16,000 TNT. <laughs> Oh, 
I think there is a way to make voxels. Let me remember. I don't know if you can do it with closed objects like that, but I think it is possible to make voxels. Let me double check that. It's been a while since I've done this, but that's because there's so many things to do that you don't do all of them very often. Let me see if I can find it. Um, oh yeah, there we go. There we go, voxels. There's the remesh modifier, which can turn anything into Minecraft. Although it wouldn't really work the house because it would get rid of all the textures. Because it's not really clear how you're supposed to keep all these textures. That being said, I can create, oh, I think I may have dragged that way too high and now my computer's starting to freeze. Oh no, oh no. Be careful when you drag sliders that add vertices. <laughs> And this is how the tutorial ends with a with a very with a very big crash. I thought I thought it was going to end with the exploding house, but I guess. Well, oh, we get oh, an exploding computer. Wait, wait it finished. <laughs> oh wow, that's all, um, Ryan. How much RAM do you have? How does this work? I am currently using. One and a half gigabytes, which is surprisingly efficient. I actually have 32 gigabytes of RAM now. Oh, wow. My graphics card has 24. You have a 24 gigabyte VRAM graphics card? Yeah. It's really useful Fancy. for machine learning. It can hold gigantic data sets in it. Gotcha. It can also Maybe render a monkey learning. in cubes very well. That it can. Like you can you can't even tell it's cubes. It looks glitchy from a distance. It looks like it's... there's just like a bunch of mesh points. And then you just edit them all together. I don't think I'm going to add the explode modifier to this. I think my, my computer might let on fire. Due to fire hazards, I'm not going oh, but you can do smooth shading. First of all, I'm gonna change the six. There, that's better. You can do smooth shading with it. You can do, ew, that looks terrible. Let's not do that. Sharp, what does sharp do? Okay. Voxel. <laughs> okay. Um, smooth. Probably the best one I've seen so far. Yeah, the idea of remesh is that you want to take some kind of regular mesh and make it more uniform. So again, used for 3D scans a lot. Or you'll have gigantic amounts of vertices in some place and only a few vertices in other, and you really want to make it nice and smooth. You can use you can use the remesh modifier to make it into a new mesh with new vertices and a new topology. And once you do that, once I have that remesh modifier, I can then use decimate on it. See, I was just like periodically removing vertices, and I took what was once a pretty monkey, and I've turned it into this abomination. Look at that cute little boy. That cute little boy. Oh, his cheeks. I just, it just makes me want to tug on his cheeks, which you can do with this tool up here, which is called this, it's called proportional editing. And, and I can tug on his cheek like that. Oh, he's so cute. Oh, get you, get you, goo. Oh. Oh. Grandma may have had a little bit too much fun. Could you showcase the uh, curve editor for the animation? OK, so I haven't used the curves for creating animations in a long time, so I'll try doing that. But I haven't done it in a while, so I'm just going to kind of improv my way and hope that I remember as I go with a new interface that I've never used before. Let's go. Let's do it. So let's do curves. Um, path. I know it's probably the one you want to use because path has direction. You can see because there's little arrows all over all over it. So then I'm going to do that. Maybe extrude a little bit more, make a path like that. Can I do that? Also, another question: Can you uh, that the the um, the pushing and pulling that you were doing with the monkey before, like just like making like a, a, a 
making making very wild fun with the monkey can you yeah. can you record that and make that an animation good question i don't think you can use proportional editing for that but there are other ways to deform objects you can use lattices actually no i take that back yes you can uh, you can use shape keys which are basically remember how you use keyframes for location rotation and position you can actually do that with vertices too Oh, so you can you can keyframe each individual vertice if you want. Kind of. Text if you want. Kind of, yeah. It doesn't work exactly like that, but it's kind of like that. You don't have individual keyframes for every individual vertex. What you can have is you have shape keys, which is basically like imagine different presets where you have like an apple and then I deform it into a sphere, right? I can then tween between different shapes. And again, this is a new version of Blender, so not exactly. I'd probably be over here. No, it wouldn't be over there. Oh, actually, I'm stuck on a curve, so I would never see that anyway. Uh, let's see. Can I do that again? Let's subdivide the monkey. Monkey's facing a lot of abuse today. Oh, yeah, no. I mean, like, this monkey's my bitch. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's my is, is this is this is this language allowed on this video? <laughs> you know, that's a good question. I think it is three a.m. Yeah, I may have, I may have, I may have descended into midnight mode. Is it midnight mode, bro? It's mm. three. It's it's morning mode. <laughs> I feel like how about late has, night? I feel like everybody has a different personality when it's this late. Like. You may know normal Ryan, but have you met Midnight Ryan? No clue. I guess I'm uh, what, what time zone college are you students. In? Same one you're in. Are you sure? Is your personality on the same time zone? The as clock's also? in the corner, by the way. Bottom right corner. It's, it's 317. No, no, but I think his personality is uh, three three hours away from here. It may be. It may be. I don't exist on the time continuum. I like to think that I have transcended past the physical needs for time and space. Descending into a madness that only gods can comprehend or people who are insane enough to believe they are gods may comprehend. Ah, yes, I can see it now. All the clocks are moving backwards. Time. Anyway, out of midnight mode and back to monkey mode. I'm going to... Subdivision surface this monkey to make it more vertices. Add viewport like that, and then click apply. And then there, we got more vertices. So now I can do the Gucci Gucci Goo again, and I can drag it by the ear. Right, I need to do this twice. Let me make sure that I can actually do this keying sense. No. No. Ah, shape keys. There we go. OK, so I'm going to add a new shape key. I guess this one is going to be called basis. I'm going to add another one. It's called key one. And then I'm going to do the Gucci Gucci Goo. Grandma's going to pull on his cheeks a little bit. Aww. Like that. He's happy. Look, I'll make him happy. Could you record something like that? So record, you mean like the, as I'm dragging it? No, I don't believe you can. But you can set different keyframes. So I'm going to create the second shape key like this. And now I can drag value like that. So I can do insert, right click, insert keyframe. Go to frame 10. Bring value to one, insert keyframe. Go to frame 20, bring it to zero, insert keyframe. Go to frame 30, insert keyframe. And now grandma's just gonna, actually maybe I should have done value one, insert keyframe, replace keyframe. Aww. By the way, this is hack health. We wanna watch out for the health of the monkey as well. Just wanna point that out. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, he has a point, I think. Yeah. So, what can be more healthy than? Um, well, I mean, if it has one head and that's healthy, imagine how healthy having two heads would be. Wait a second. Oh my goodness, what am I witnessing? <laughs> You're witnessing Midnight Monkey. All right, look how adorable that is. This is where all the cursed blender stuff comes from. Oh my god. <laughs> Yes. Now, if you really want it to be cursed, we got to add some kind of like eerie background to it. Like go into world mode. It's like Neptune, right? I'm gonna make this like, add some rings, make this like the final frontier of space and time. Or, or what should we do? A water wheel made of a monkey of monkeys that's just like rolling on the rolling on the water. Oh yeah, okay. Let's do that. Yeah. We're gonna oh, add that, was, that was just a joke idea, but okay. Well, I mean, why not? Why not? We're gonna make this 100 by 100, and we're gonna use the wave modifier. We're gonna make it nice and shiny too. We're gonna make this nice shiny water. Make it. Not rough at all. And we're going to have some kind of world here. I love how this is supposed to be a tutorial, but we're just we're just absolutely having the best time ever. <laughs> I mean, I am showing you a lot of things. But yeah, it's fine. Ryan, you should really consider making a YouTube channel with, with um, Blender tutorials. I think this is what the people want. Maybe, maybe. Are there any comments in the chat right now? Um, not anymore because it is 3.23 a.m. Fair enough. I'm gonna it's do... been over two hours. Yeah, no, like at first I was kind of worried that I wouldn't have enough content to cover this, but now I'm just having fun. This is fun. Somebody said, um, tell Ryan his personality is A++++++ 2 a.m. crackhead energy. <laughs> Why, thank you. Uh... Uh, petitions for Ryan to start YouTube. Uh, there are people commenting on Genshin Impact too. Yeah. Impact? Somebody said you made an abstract squirrel. I don't remember which part that was. Is this the abstract squirrel right here? I could totally see this as a squirrel. Okay, I think at this point anything could be an abstract squirrel. Absolutely. Uh, Honestly, what's the difference between a monkey and a squirrel? Five legs and a paw? Like, who, who knows? There are at least four people who say you should have a YouTube channel. Mm hmm. Maybe I should consider this on my list of things to do. I mean, I am on YouTube right now. I mean, yeah, you are. This is the Stony Brook Wix channel. You need your own channel, man. I may. Maybe. Maybe. If I do. You could. You could use you could use a uh, blender to create like um, and and uh, a three D animation intro kind of thing. A three D like, intro, like like create creating a text that says blender tutorials and then some animating it somehow. You know, then... back when I was like eight, I actually did that for my YouTube channel. Um, I have really old videos on here. Um, like. Like this one. Like my, my channel is called Neptitron. I, I don't even remember why I called it that. But that was supposed to be where there's a bunch of different video links and never actually got around to filling it out. Or I think like... I think we should close the stream here for the sanity of people in <laughs> this two and a half hour long video. Yeah, we could. Yeah. You know what? This tutorial is done. Everybody who wants to stay here for fun can do that.